the space force. <laughs> Such an interesting concept that I instantly fall in love with any story about it. Well, you might remember I did one a few months ago on this issue, but this one is not connected to it in any way, shape or form. It's just still such an intriguing concept for me though, and one that I hope you're going to enjoy. And just to let you know, it looks like this might be the first episode in an ongoing series, but let me know if you enjoy it, and I will keep going. So my dear friends, we've once again reached Friday, and I think you all deserve to sit back and relax one more time this week with your favourite drink, and listen. Yeah, you've probably read the description of a guy like me before. I graduated from the Air Force Academy, top of my class. Got my choice of slots for undergrad pilot training. Ran track and field at the Academy. <laughs> Boxed. 4.0 grade point average. AM 490 course. Father was VCSAF. Uncle and Grandpa were both Magecom commanders. President's 100. Etc, etc, etc. Long story short, after flying strike eagles and raptors for seven years, I was selected to become an American astronaut. But before my training was over, things began to change. About half a decade ago, a Homelander-controlled Congress passed the new Space National Security Act in the face of severe disapproval from the Department of the Air Force, the Alliances, YPP and FPML. The Space Corps created by the bill was from the outset designed to have a Marine Corps-like relationship with the Air Force. It would be formed over a five-year period as a staggered merger between the Army's SMDC, Air Force Space Command, and the Navy's SPA War, while eventually absorbing the Naval Satellite Operations Center, the U.S. Reconnaissance Office, which in turn pissed off the alliances even more, and NASA's Astronaut Corps. Now this is where I come in. It was no secret among my class of prospective astronauts that the final neutering of the nation's storied space agency was just around the corner, creeping like a wild fox in a house of sleeping hens. The expectation was that we would be rolled into the Space Corps, either after graduation from training or just before its completion. Even after the Homeland Party lost control of both houses to a coalition of its rivals, constant inability of that coalition to agree on terms when it came to most issues meant that there would be no threat to the space service's existence. The fact that, at the same time, the Homeland Party was able to secure the presidency cemented the inevitability of its ascendance. Our new commander-in-chief, mad Frank Monterey, the man famous for his fierce public championing of low defense projects like the F-35, ASAD development, absolute national missile defense and countless others have been a major investor in NASA's 21st century rival. Expanded resources and aerospace services, also known as IRAS, the company responsible for initial human moon basing efforts, hand in hand in cooperation with the China National Space Administration. The establishment of the Armstrong and Sea of Tranquility settlements was a source of renewed hope and lust for the future of the planet's surface. Although things were certainly tense at times, and while both nations were most definitely not friends, the Sino-American rivalry was seen by most in the middle at that time as fundamentally different from the Cold War. Monterey couldn't have disagreed with this sentiment more, although he hated them, and even campaigned on an anti-Chinese sentiment. He understood what the initial partnership IRS had created with the Chinese meant for the future of America in space. He also knew, when the time was right, that he would crush the proverbial throat of the Chinese space presence. Now, as our class completed our required training, me and a few of my peers had been invited to a seminar held in wine country put on by the International Air Combat Study that would cover the future of space development and militarization. Attendees would include NASA officials, their Chinese and Japanese counterparts, senior officers and NCOs from the US Air Force, Space Corps and Navy, representatives of the People's Liberation Army, and, most significantly, the President of the United States. 
it would be here that President Monterey would attempt to humiliate and infuriate the Chinese delegation by announcing the American policy primer on Astropolitik on the last day of the seminar. In his closed-door statement, with PLA officers watching on in steely anger, the President made clear that the United States viewed itself as the arbiter of space and would only be at peace with purely civilian developments and endeavors by foreign nations. The message was now clear. The United States would no longer accept or tolerate the militarization of space by any nation other than itself. A Monroe Doctrine in Orbit, one headline called it that same evening. The anger felt by this announcement within China, and even in Japan, which hadn't expected such an announcement, was compounded by the events of the day before. The chief executive of Eras, and good friend of the president, had announced in an interview with Slice Weekly World the successful completion of humanity's first asteroid mining operation. About an hour later, a different Eras spokesman would quietly confirm over email with a reporter that the company would begin to gradually limit its cooperation with the CNSA, with the eventual goal of cutting them off completely. This would most assuredly put the future of the Sea of Tranquility into question. A month before, the Chinese had openly condemned being abruptly left out of the New American Habitation Project, the colonization of the Kolodewski dust satellites, via the relocation of hollowed-out, previously mined asteroids, to Lagrange Point 5. The entire situation, when taking earthly geopolitics into account, was like throwing salt into an open wound in an acid shower. The seminar was over. The damage, or progress made, was done. I stepped out of the back of my ride and into the hotel entrance where I was staying, giving the driver an extra tip before he left. The hotel was a nice one, by government travel card standards. All rooms featured a view of one of the two courtyards, one sporting a fire pit, a picturesque grassy couple of acres in the back adjacent to the pool, presumably for weddings, a small creek further back from that with numerous sidewalks for strolls, and even a bridge over the stream to a small park. Plenty of statues as well, the attempted style of which I couldn't discern. Perhaps they were going for an ancient Greek, sophisticated style to everything, but I don't possess the class or taste to reliably provide an answer. Behind the reception desk sat a young girl, likely in her early twenties, raven hair, brown eyes. Some of the most doe-like I'd ever seen. She was quite distracting, actually. Those porcelain legs of hers, crossed and presented so minxily to those passing by her workspace, didn't help either. She looked up from her desktop monitor, saw me through her bespectacled gaze, smiled slightly, and called out to me. Mr. Connolly? I looked behind and around me for a second. I knew she was talking to me, but for some reason this little girl managed to slightly intimidate it. M Mr. Connolly, right? She asked again. <laughs> yes, I responded happily. She seemed brighter now comforting me somewhat, as if she melted my insides with her grin. My guard was down now, and I somehow detected hers was too, as I smiled back. Sorry, I have real bad hearing sometimes. Being around jet engines all the time can do that. <laughs> no problem, sir. I apologize for calling out to you like that, she said sheepishly. Not at all, gorgeous. I complimented her, the girl's cheeks turning red. Did you have something for me? I asked. Yes, sir. Some of your friends wanted me to notify you that the briefing will be within the next hour in room 241. I looked at her, puzzled. Briefing? Friends? What? Was it Lieutenant Jacob or Lieutenant Geyser? Why wouldn't they just tell me? Now she was confused. No, sir. Not those two. Um... The lovely girl fiddled with her post-it notes. Um, a Sergeant Horace and a Petty Officer Gregory. Two women, she stated to me. Hmm. 
two women. I don't... All right, then. Thank you. She smiled again. Of course. I hope all goes well. I turned as if to walk away, but caught myself and asked, Mind if I know your name? <laughs> don't mean to impose or anything, but I leave tomorrow. I'd regret never learning it, considering how gorgeous you are. Now her face was completely flushed, and her smile nervous. <laughs> Poinsettia, she said quietly at first, but then clearing her throat, stating it again. Poinsettia. I raised an eyebrow. Mm, poinsettia, <laughs> that's definitely unique, but lovely all the same, as you are. She laughed. <laughs> Thank you. You can call me Seti, though. That's what my friends call me. My mom was a florist and loves Christmas, so to her it made sense. I always thought it was kind of a jip, though. My sister got a normal name, Constance. I noticed the nervousness in her laugh as she said that. I reassured her. Well, I'd rather be talking to a poinsettia than a Constance right now. She looked down, flattered. <laughs> Thank you, and looked back up. Hope we see each other again. I responded back. <laughs> Maybe we will. Have a good night, Seti. And let her be. A little bit later, I'd finally gotten out of my blues and had a few drinks. And asked Jakey and Geyser if they'd heard about this briefing. They said they had, but were told it wasn't until tomorrow. Also, the people who were going to be briefing them were two other females with completely different names. Zero warning, zero explanation. Something bizarre was going on, which put me on edge for the rest of the hour. The both of them came down with me to 241, just to be safe due to how weird it was. I knocked on the door. No answer. I knocked once more. No answer again. Just as we were about to turn to the left and back down the hall, a smoky but soothing feminine voice interrupted us from our right. Lieutenant. I looked. Two tall women in what seemed to be Class B uniforms, both in skirts, which was becoming a rare sight in these military days. The one in front was Navy, with Petty Officer First Class rank. The one behind her was wearing the new preliminary uniform of the Space Corps. The Navy girl stuck her hand out. I'm Petty Officer Gregory. This is Space System Sergeant Horace. We were sent by the Strike Division to brief you. I looked at her with a thousand-yard stare for a minute. She persisted. This is about the transition. Oh, and other issues. She looked at Jakey and Geisel. You two don't need to be here, sirs. This is just for Lieutenant Connolly. They looked at each other, and then looked at me. Well, we'll see you, Mike, they said hesitantly. Uh, all right, I said back, uncomfortable. The room wasn't very well lit. Just a single lamp in the far left corner providing the space with orange-tinted illumination. The redhead, Sergeant Horace, turned another one on near the table next to the bed. The petty officer motioned me to sit down as the sergeant collected some vanilla folders. The petty officer kicked her heels off by the corner of the bed and sat down next to me. She said to her companion, Jess, you mind stirring us up something? Yes, ma'am. Don't mind if I do, the sergeant affirmed. Oh, get the lieutenant something as well, she further instructed. He'll need it. I loosened my shoulders up a bit, staring at the documents enclosed on the tabletop. Just what is this about, exactly? If it's about the transition, where are the Space Corps people I usually talk to? And why, a briefing, I demanded. She rolled her eyes slightly and drew some breath in. Look, sir. Let me ask you this. Did your OIC over at the 50th give you any idea what this may be about? No, not at all. He just said we'd been invited to this seminar. 
the sergeant placed a drink in front of me, along with the soda coke can she used to make it. Oh, in case you need a chaser. I became somewhat offended at that implication. She laughed. <laughs> Sorry, sir. It's not like I know if you're a lightweight or not. I groaned at her. He hasn't told me jack shit, I reiterated. I see. I knew he'd puss out of telling you. This just keeps getting more and more curious, I thought. Jess, you mind? She pointed at the stacks of folders on the table. Mm-hmm, the redhead replied. She began to open them, carefully taking out what they wanted me to see, and nothing more. Schematics, technical information, old Polaroid photographs, engineer's notes, performance evaluations, all referencing Detachment 3 of the Air Force Flight Test Center. Oh, dreamland, I said under my breath as my eyes were allowed to soak these images into my brain, all of them featuring a spade-like spacecraft, or what I assumed to be a spacecraft, and its mothership, which noticeably resembled the ill-fated XB-70, as if it were its forgotten love child from another continent. The former was referred to in these documents as the Black Star, Experimental Orbital Vehicle, while the latter was labelled as Brilliant Buzzard SR-3. I felt like a little kid who found his dad's playboys under the bed. I had to forcefully break my gaze from it in order to ask her, why are you showing me this? And why are you showing me this here, of all places? Shouldn't we be in SCIF right now? She took one of the photos out of my hand. Sir, if you even try to think about this vehicle outside of this location without permission, you'd be halfway to Guantanamo before the neurons and synapses in your brain even knew what happened. The redhead piped in. You've been under careful watch since you left Cape Canaveral. We're both assigned to the Air Force Special Activity Center as its token space corpsmen. Same goes for certain people at the seminar. Waiters and baristas you've interacted with. Drivers. Petty Officer Gregory finished her sentence. Oh, and cute hotel receptionists with long legs and funny names. This situation is under our control, sir. This was a startling implication, to say the least. It felt like something was crawling beneath my skin. She put her hand on my forearm to reassure me and said, It's nothing to worry about, sir. We don't suspect you of anything. What we're about to ask you of is of grave importance to the national security and power of the United States going forward. I asked her, Then just explain to me, what the hell it is you want me to do? I take it you want me to fly this thing. She pulled back and took a swig of her mix as I spoke. Essentially, you and the other two are getting rolled into the corps sooner than the rest of your class from the mission you'll be undertaking. I'm sure you're already familiar with the upgraded man version of the mystery already? She asked. I said, yes, the MS-1B. The OIC has been quite excited about what we're going to be able to do with it once me and the guys are assigned to the Leopards. But she cut me off before I could finish saying the name of the squadron. Lieutenant Jacob and Lieutenant Geyser will be going to the 54th. Well, they'll be working with the B. You, however, will be going to the 7th Orbital Operations Squadron in order to directly cooperate with the Special Projects Division in the employment of the XOV. She took another sip of her drink as her compatriot finished her sentence for her with the word Major. Excuse me. I just made the list for Captain Bailey a few weeks ago, I explained. The sergeant shook her head and reiterated. And you will be a Major when you enter the call. Similarly, Jacob and Geyser will be promoted early to captain as well. Consider it a compensation bonus for all three of you, in light of the risk you'll be undertaking when you're up there. Hmm. Risk? I mean, 
other than the usual considerations. What's so uniquely risky about flying this thing? I asked, unsettled again. Things were simply getting more and more bizarre. Oh, nothing in particular, the petty officer added. It's actually quite old. Never went into full production. Just a curious blackbird replacement the Groom Lake people didn't get much utility out of. They got tired of messing around with it, so as one of our first hurrahs into orbit, our young service is going to get to decommission it. Under fire. That's why we're promoting you as incentive to take on the mission. We weren't considering it before the last couple of days, but due to exigent circumstances, it was found to be the most prudent option to offer it to you. Hmm, what the fuck do you mean, under fire? Are you talking about combat? We've only simulated space to space so far. Hell, we've only simulated counter space for that matter. I was beginning to raise my voice. She flattened her hand and gestured for me to calm down. Well, yes and no, she said softly, beginning to sound a bit more raspy in her voice. She tossed a few photographs of a Chinese space plane my way. These were taken more recently, as I inferred that they must have been shot with a digital camera. However, they were still incredibly grainy. I can make out a small space plane in the middle of a flurry of space debris, and large rocky objects. The craft resembled the MS-1A, but it was too hard to tell. Sergeant Horace interrupted my concentration. That's a PLA Shenlong, about 30 hours ago. What's wrong with it? Did we shoot at it or something? I asked. Yes, P.O. Gregory informed me. The 668th was directing a pair of F-15s out of California on a short-notice ASAT mission. My mind began racing. Were we trying to go to war already? So, um, you guys shot at it. Why before the President announced his new policy? I asked. She shook her head again, implying my assumption was wrong. We weren't trying to shoot at it. We were shooting at something else entirely. She tapped on an amorphous object barely visible in the background of one of the photos. I looked up from the enigma, my eyes meeting her piercing gaze as she spoke, as if she were a cold-blooded python consuming a small mammal. Sir, let's just cut to the chase. You're going to take this promotion. You're going to escort Jacob and Geyser to New America, and you three are going to kill the sole survivor stuck on that Shenlong. And you're going to do it all before that thing decides to kill you. So another one from Dr. Creepin's Vault there, the subreddit I set up so you could send your stories for me and I could read them for you. And, well, when I think something's a series, I usually wait until the author's written two or three episodes, so I get a bit of a feel for it and I see if I can guess whether you're going to like it or not. But, well, that isn't even marked down as episode one, but I'm so intrigued by it, I just hope, hope, hope that the author's going to write some more for us. If you agree, then be sure to leave some comments before, uh, below the video and... Uh, let us all know what you think, okay? Well, that's enough for me for one week. I, of course, will be back again on Monday, and I hope you're going to join me. Until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your story.
place. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay? <laughs>